Okay, everybody. Everybody in the saddle, are we ready? Beginning a new series. We're beginning a new series. <clears throat> it's time for me, by the grace and mercy of my God and save Lord Jesus Christ, to put James White's arguments to bed. It's a long time coming, but now I need to start doing it. So glory to the triune God. Yeah, the Father, the Spirit. Yeah, the Father, the Spirit. Yep. Time to put his arguments to bed. That's what's going to happen. So we'll wait a few more minutes for the regular show up. We'll begin in prayer because I have a lot of links to share with everyone. And we'll explain why I'm doing the series. I had planned to do this a while back, but God's timing is perfect. The timing of the triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, is always perfect. So it's time now. It's time for me to refute James White's arguments, put them to bed. So now he knows the arguments. They're going to be archived. It's in the public domain. And so now he has no excuse to avoid debating me. So hopefully by the grace and mercy of Lord Jesus Christ, James White will debate me on particular redemption. That's the topic he must debate. And if he doesn't, then we will know why. He's afraid. I have to be honest. James, I hope you're watching this. You're afraid. Let's do it. And if you think that you're the expert of the Greek New Testament and you're a scholar and a champion of this position, put me in my place because no one's going to buy your excuse that I'm mean and nasty. That doesn't work because people see when I debate, I try to be very gracious. Even though my aim is to <clears throat> totally refute the objections and demonstrate their fallaciousness. So glory to the triune God, glory to the Father, glory to the Son, the Lord Jesus, glory to the Holy Spirit. Father, you are worthy of praise and worship and honor. Lord Jesus, Son of God, you are worthy of praise and worship and honor. Holy Spirit, you are worthy of praise and worship and honor. For you are the only true God, the Father, the eternal Son of the Father, the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You are our God, our creator, our maker, our potter, our preserver, our life giver, our sustainer, <clears throat> our savior, our redeemer, our deliverer, <clears throat> uh, our king, our sovereign, our Lord, our life, our love, our all in all. You alone are <clears throat> the God that we seek, the God that we call upon, the God that we cry out to, the God that we cling to and trust in. And love and adorn worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is the Father, his eternal Son, his eternal Spirit. Yahovah. Yahovah Elohim. We love you. We love you, Babi. We love you, Abba. We love you, Son of God, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that the Lord Jesus, your Son, will increase in us, transform us by your Spirit to conform to the image of your Son by the power of your eternal Spirit. Save us from our flesh, our sinful passions. Save us from Satan and his influence, from his children. Save us from their snares, from all evil, Father. And keep us pure and holy and in love with Jesus Christ. Give us the power to endure till the end by faithfulness, trusting in you and Jesus and your spirit. To never betray you, to never deny you, never blaspheme your name, never slander the name of Jesus Christ, never blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ, and never to fall into scandals dishonoring our Lord. Save us from that, O oh God. Save us from our pride and our arrogance and our ego and our lies and our deceit and our hypocrisy. And heal us, Father. Heal us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Heal us, Lord Jesus. Heal us, Holy Spirit. Illuminate us, Abba, we ask. Illuminate us with wisdom from the Holy Spirit to plunge the depth of Scripture, to bring out the meat of Scripture. Save us from error, misinterpretation, from stammering, from stuttering, from confusion. And empowered by your Spirit to recall all the Scriptural scriptural passages every specific portion of scripture perfectly recalling them perfect my ability to recall them and give us power from your spirit to live out your word perfectly proclaim your word love your word even die for your word the holy bible because your word is truth and your word is your voice the voice of your son the voice of your spirit fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with life from your spirit strengthen my voice and anoint the sound of my voice bless 
my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your children, Father, gathered. Bring them, Father, please, Lord. May the Lord Jesus increase, may we decrease. Destroy distractions, destroy attacks of Satan, strengthen the internet, and guide this converse, conversation not to be politically correct, not to be a crowd pleaser, not to tickle ears, but not to be unnecessarily offensive. Please, my God. Even as I critique James White, and I pray you save him from his pride and arrogance and nastiness. And please, Father, save me from my nastiness. Please, Lord, not to fall <clears throat> under your discipline and become of no use. Please, my God, please save us for your glory. We love you, Bobby. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Bless our loved ones. Bless our our family members, our spouses, if we're married, our parents, our siblings, our children, grandchildren. Whoever they are, bless them and bring them to the feet of Jesus. In my case, my daughters, even their mother, sear her heart to never be happy until she falls before the feet of Jesus and repents of her sinful ways. We thank you, my God, in Jesus' almighty name. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. Welcome, everyone. This is my second session today. I know that in some parts of the world, it is still... Too early in the morning, so people are sleeping. But in other parts, it would be afternoon or evening. Now, on this side of the continent, it's still not too late for people in New York and Michigan. Because in New York, it's now 10 o'clock. So it's not too late. So I'm going to be going live in different hours, as my schedule permits, to reach as many people from different parts of the world. But the beautiful thing is, it's all archived. It's all archived. So even if you don't watch live, it's archived. So just hit the like button, watch it thoroughly, and rewatch it until you understand the arguments and they become second nature by the grace of Jesus Christ. And again, I'm giving you permission. You can take any of my videos, any of my videos, upload them to your YouTube channel, make clips out of them, translate them for the glory of Jesus Christ. And any of my articles, upload them to your websites, translate them for the glory of Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit guides me and saves me from error to speak truth without error, all glory to Jesus Christ. Because my sessions, my articles are not perfect. Only the Holy Bible is perfect. So with that said, good to see you, Tatiana. They just finished this late. What's going on? So that means Hatun is not live. Good timing. Glory to God. Timing is perfect. She finished. I go live. Okay. <clears throat> I know the title's provocative. Some would call it clickbait, but I deliberately titled this James White's War with John Calvin on the Atonement. I will, Lord Jesus willing, in the upcoming weeks, do a series refuting James White's arguments for particular redemption. And I will also continue finishing <clears throat> all the other parts and all the other series that I started by the grace of Jesus Christ. And we will be exploring new topics, right? We'll be talking about new things. Okay, thank you, Tatiana. Now you bless my heart. Masha and Tatiana, more so Tatiana. God bless my sister Atun, but I prefer we discuss biblical topics than Muhammad's birthday. There's always a time to refute Muhammad, but let me tell you something. I'm not saying this to bring people to myself, honestly. If Christians were to spend more time learning their faith, learning their Bible, we would have a church on fire and sold out, turning the world upside down and taking the world captive for the glory of Jesus Christ, as opposed to the world silencing the church because we'd be mighty in the spirit. But if you have a talk, topic about, let's say, Islam, you'll get 700 people. If you have a topic about end time prophecy, you'll get hundreds of people. Healing, but when it comes to core doctrines of the Christian faith, I mean, I praise the trying God. We still get good crowds. We get about 300 to 400 may increase quality people for the glory of Jesus. Because that means you are hungry and you want to know the word. But, but can you imagine if we could pack a session with Christians who are hungry to learn the core doctrines of the fit, Christian faith? The inspiration of the Bible. The canonization of the Bible. The preservation of the Bible. Doctrines such as salvation. Church what's called ecclesiology, the Trinity, hypostatic union. Wow, that would be amazing. Right? 
So I do a thank you that you came here, not because I want to take people away from Hatun. It's not competition. But I'd rather have people come learn the faith. And one thing, and this is loving criticism of Hatun, because I've told her in private, and I'm going to say it publicly. I told her, spend more time defending the Christian faith. Over 90% of the material on DCCI is critiquing Islam. Balance it out. Half the time, defend Christianity. Half the time, refute Islam. Not over 90% critiquing Islam, right? We need more of our apologists who are witnessing to Muslims to produce more responses defending the faith than simply criticizing Islam. Because when you attack Islam and you destroy a Muslim's faith, that's no guarantee they become Christian. Most of them become agnostic, if not atheist. They become secular humanists. Look at apostate prophet. Look at Abdullah Samir, right? What do you say about them? And I, may, I pray the Lord Jesus will save me from being too loud so I don't cause my neighbors to stumble. Ya Allah. What do you say about droves of Muslims who had their faith in Islam destroyed, but they, just, they still didn't become Christian? And by the way, let me share another thing. Do you know that though they'll tell you that the church in Iran is exploding, hundreds of thousands of Iranians are becoming Christian. You know what they don't tell you? You know what you don't hear? That many of the Iranians are becoming modalists. They're becoming oneness anti-Trinitarians. Did you know that? But you're not hearing that. Many of the Iranians that are becoming Christians are actually becoming modalists, oneness anti-Trinitarians. In fact, did you recently hear, he was in prison a while back, that Persian pastor, the Iranian pastor, who was in prison and let go you know he's a oneness pastor he's an anti-trinitarian he's a genus jesus only pastor do you know that i don't know if you guys know this yep so now that's with that said i have to do the series now i know a lot of people who follow james white will be upset with me but now let's be fair Let's be honest. Let's be consistent. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's not point to people's splinters while the beams in our eyes are sticking out. Why am I doing the series? Let me give you my reason. Let me set it, out, set it forth in the beginning so people, when they come, they'll see. Number one, James White is associated. Number one, James White is associated with particular redemption, and many look to him. Many look to him as being one of the greatest champions, defenders of limited atonement. So when you refute his arguments, the gig is up. If you take the best that James White has and you show how shallow those arguments are, how pathetically bad these arguments are, scripturally, exegetically speaking, the gig is up. Even the best of the proponents of particular redemption are incapable of defending this man-made doctrine. And I don't want to offend some of the five-point Calvinists, but you know what? Some of them deserve to be offended because of their nasty vitriol, their nasty, rude, arrogant attacks on anyone, especially me, who disagrees with particular redemption. That's number one. Number two, I'm giving James White a taste of his own medicine. You know, the same measure by which you measure out against someone will be then used against you. The measure you use against someone will then be turned against you. So I'm giving James White a taste of his own medicine, and deservedly so, right? It is time that someone who knows him very well stands up to some of his antics and his very ungracious, rude manner, his very ungracious manner towards brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, humble servants. I'm not one of them. So I'm not saying I'm a humble servant. May Jesus save me from my anger and my pride and my arrogance. I'm talking about those humble Christians who love Jesus Christ, whom James White goes after in the most ungracious and nasty manner and uses his knowledge of languages to try to intimidate them, but it doesn't work. It's actually imploding against him, which is why he's become one of the most disliked apologists all over social media, even disliked by fellow Reformed Baptists and Calvinists. Because he does not check his pride and arrogance. And I'm going to prove it to you. 
I'm going to give you some links. Here you go. Here's the link to Leighton Flowers Soteriology 101. Those of you who are coming out of Calvinism or coming out of Tulip or want to hear criticisms of Tulip, go to Soteriology 101 and subscribe to it, Leighton Flowers. Here I put in the search engine his videos responding to James White. Here it is. Okay. Click on it. He's got a series of sessions where he's responding to James White. Here's one in particular I want you to listen to, all right? Um, Just watch. Watch the sessions. He will take James White's clips. Look at James White's face and demeanor when he criticizes Leighton Flower. Condescending, rude, mockery, bullying. You'll see it with your own eyes and ears. Even though James White thinks he's being gracious and he's doing apologetics for the glory of the Lord. I want to play you a clip. I want you to listen to this. I got to put things in perspective. There's a time and a place where you need to put a bully in his place. There's a time where you answer a fool according to his own folly to embarrass him and silence him for the glory of Jesus Christ. But here, click on this link, guys, please. I'm giving you links for your benefit. Click on it to put this in perspective. To put this in perspective. Let me repeat what Tatiana just said. Leighton Flowers, my sister in the Lord, Leighton Flowers is one of the most gracious, kindest men you'll ever know. Undoubtedly, yes. She's absolutely right. That is not a lie. He's one of the most gracious, kindest men you'll ever know. Okay. Now, Tatiana... You need to be in full-time ministry. When are you going to heed the calling, sister? Come on. You have a passion for ministry. You love apologetics. You love preaching the gospel. You got to get in ministry. Come on. All right. Anyway. Now, with that said, here's the link. Leighton Flowers takes James White's criticism of Leighton Flowers' criticism of James White's exegesis of John 6. Here, I'm going to play the... The, the mark from the two-hour, 13-minute mark. Pay attention. Two-hour, 13-minute mark. Do I have your attention? Pray the Lord Jesus brings over 300 tonight, close to four. And please, my God, for your glory, for your honor, not for me. Okay, watch here. Watch here, guys. The two-hour, 13-minute mark. Listen, fair use. Out of where the author is when he's writing it, whether he's in prison or not, whether um, Listen, it's, it's before the destruction of the temple or after the destruction of the temple, whatever it may be. What I'm doing. Why are all those things so relevant? Because they help us to understand the intention of the author in his given context, right? And so when we understand the wedding banquet parable of Jesus, where he gives this parable pretty much giving an overview of what's happening, of the gospel first being sent to the Jews, them stoning the messengers and then him taking it and sending it to the by highways and the byways. Well, what in John chapter six, what stage are we in Watch the here. parable? In John chapter six, we're in the stage where he's taking the message. He's about to take the message and send the message to the Jews first, right? Um, before he sends it to the oh, Gentiles. I'm sorry. Well, what's I happening in Romans guys. 9? Remember uh, when I used I'm the so sorry. wedding banquet? I'm That's thinking I'm not the, oh, man. Michael this Brown tells you I'm not the challenge. Listening to you critique me about every. Okay, sorry about that. I'm thinking I'm in the two hour, 13 minute mark. I'm saying, okay, how come he's not getting to the point? Forgive me, guys. Here we go. I just. Yeah. In two weeks or so. Listen. Spending hours talking about my position. Don't you think they would appreciate having some time for us to have some cordial back and forth conversation. Listen, guys. Maybe talk about our spouses and our families a little bit so that we can humanize each other just a little bit so we don't act so cantankerous around each other maybe. Maybe maybe you'll like me as much as Dr. Brown. I mean, Dr. Brown and I got along really well in the green room when we were speaking at that event together. I think you and I probably could get along okay if you, you know, humanize me a little bit and realize that I'm We're coming nice right around there. You know, we can Listen, actually have a I'm conversation. I'm tired of your analogies. Here. I'm tired of your allegories, but I will do this with you. We'll do a debate. Only thing you can use is the Greek text. Only thing you can use is the Greek text. And, and then can we Did you catch it? You see the bullying tactics? Do you see how he tries to intimidate him and bully him? No, that's Leighton Flowers laughing because no one is intimidated by James White anymore. And I don't think he realizes it. 
Did you see the tactics? Do you see the bullying? Do you see the nastiness towards his fellow Christian brother? Do you see how he's trying to diminish? We'll just use the Greek text. Now, in all honesty, I don't want to become like James White. May the Lord Jesus save him and save me from becoming like that. And I've said, I don't want to take my YouTube channel and turn it into a DL <clears throat> dividing line where now James White, all he does on his dividing line, prove me wrong. For the last six years, over 90% of his DL shows, taking clips of Christians and refuting them. Of what relevance is this man? To the kingdom anymore of what relevance of what benefit is he to the kingdom of jesus christ when your ministry is now characterized by critiquing christians and at times in the most ungracious manner do you really have a ministry anymore are you really honoring to jesus christ are you really useful to the kingdom are you a thorn in the side of your brothers and a tool of the devil to try to hinder them from glorifying Christ and reaching the unsaved, the good news of Jesus Christ? Okay? You saw that right? Let me play it one more time. And Leighton Flowers is laughing. Wilson's debate, only thing he can use is laugh a little bit and realize that. Watch. Listen. I'm a pretty nice guy. I'll you let know, him we can actually it. have a conversation. I'm tired of your analogies. And I'm tired of your allegories, but I will do this with you. We'll do a debate. Only thing you can use is the Greek text. Only thing you can use is the Greek text. And and then Ken Wilson's debate. Only thing you can use is Latin. Just that's the new rule. We just made it. And if you don't say yes, it's because you're chicken. How about it? Listen. Well, that's not fair. No, it is fair. John six, nothing but the Greek text. Because you cannot walk through this. And I'm not talking about your abilities or inabilities in Greek. You do say Dr. Layton Flowers, right? You are? Yes. Okay. It has nothing to do with my abilities okay. Greek-wise. I mean, if I wanted to sit down for the next 30 days or 60 days, however long you get me in, just start memorizing Greek so that I can impress the audience at how well I was able to pronounce the words that I learned how to pronounce. I'm right after this. Um, everybody could be impressed and clap for Layton. It's not about Layton. Dr. White, it's not about you. This is about the word of God. This is about understanding the word of God. And I think the English version of the word of God, which was sovereignly brought to pass, is sufficient, especially all the hundreds of translations we have of it to look at. There is a comment in the live chat. I'm just looking at it. Look what this person said. Good shorts. Comment. Good shorts. LOL. James, seriously, you sound like the Muslims that say you can only read the Quran in Arabic. Bam. Simple earthling. James White is such a scoundrel. LOL. He doesn't see how disgusting he's become. I don't think you have to know Greek to understand what Paul intended to say in Romans 9. Just like I don't think you have to know Greek to understand what Jesus intended in John chapter 6. I don't. I think it can be helpful. I think our tools are helpful. I th I'm glad that I'm we have Logos and all these other tools at our disposal to look at the lexicons and bring up the Greek text. But there is no reason to suggest that I couldn't have notes in order to debate you because I do better with notes. Why wouldn't you want me at my why wouldn't you want me at my best if you're going to do a debate? And why is it that you always get to choose the text? Here's what I want you to hear. This is the part I want you to hear. Another disgusting tactic on James White's part. So he's getting a t taste of his own medicine. The measure he uses against brethren now is going to be used against him. Proverbs 26, 5, answer a fool like James White according to his folly, lest he becomes wise in his own eyes. James White will be quick to challenge you to, to debate those chapters of scripture that he's comfortable with. He'll challenge you, let's debate John 6, Romans 9. But he is a coward when it comes to debating chapters that he knows he cannot <clears throat> get away from he will never debate you on john 15 the vine and the branches he will never debate you on romans 11 romans 11 never but he insists that you debate him on romans 9 taking it out of context because the context romans 9 ends at romans 11 and insists to debate you on john 6 but he won't debate you let's say on john 15 he'll tell you no because that's not fair. You have to take the totality of Scripture. So he 
pays lip service to tota scriptura, the totality of scripture, when it becomes a convenient tool to get him out of debating specific chapters, but then it'll insist you debate me on John 6 and only John 6 and in the Greek or Romans 9, but not Romans 11. And tonight, folks, you're in for a treat. I'm going to use John Calvin to bury James White's understanding of the Greek. John Calvin will bury and destroy James White's butchering of the Greek. Get ready for that. By the grace of the Chime God. William Goodman, stop disturbing me and trying to get my attention by asking me questions on related topic. I will block you because you're being disrespectful. Stop with the the attention getting when you know what the topic is. All right. Now let's finish. I'll let him finish this point because I got some articles to give you. You got to choose Romans 9, one of the most difficult texts to go through in 20 minute opener. What why not let me choose a text? And may, let me set the rules as to what you can and can't do. Let me let me tie your hands behind your back with one of my favorite proof texts for once. Let's see how you handle it. Would you even be willing to do it? Are you smart enough not, never to do a debate you know you couldn't win? Maybe that's the reason this is happening here. I think you put those kind of conditions upon our engagement because you know I'll say no thanks to that invitation. And then that can take the, the heat off of you for your unwillingness to have a simple living room conversation. I mean, for goodness sake, um, you are willing to sit down in a living room with the, the what's his name? I mean, to say his name because uh, he's a guy that screams down Calvinists, calls you heretics. Things are all going Stephen to hell. Anderson. He's a King James version only, I think. You sit down in the living room with this man and had a relatively cordial conversation with him for hours, I think. Yep, Stephen Anderson. You're willing to do that with that guy and not me? Am I really Am I really that off-putting to you, Dr. White? I mean, I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. Unless, unless you really think I just sound too reasonable. I mean, that's I've had people tell me, exactly. James White doesn't want to engage with you in a live broadcast because you sound too reasonable in person. Exactly. So here's the link again, and I'm going to give you the link where he shows how ungracious and nasty James White is. Be honest with me, guys. How disgusting and arrogant and how much of a turnoff that was to hear James White say, I'll debate you in John 6 in Greek, only in Greek. Does that make you want to listen to him? Does that endear himself to you? So that's the link, and here's the other link, and I got a couple more to give you. So this is why it's time for me to put to rest James White's argument for limited atonement. I'm going to use Jan Calvin. Listen to what I'm saying. James White, I hope you listen to this. I'm going to use John Calvin to destroy your butchering of the Greek, to show you're not the Greek scholar that you make yourself out to be and that you use to bully and intimidate people. No one is buying it. No one is scared of you, brother. It's time for you to repent or get out of the way and let us do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ because you are a hindrance to us, right, and a stumbling block to many. May God have mercy on you, because if he doesn't, he's going to give you what you deserve. And may Jesus have mercy on me and not allow me to end up where you ended up. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on me. And I pray that for you. Here's the link. Which brings up another point. Have you noticed that when David Wood ate the Quran, uh, James White was quick, quick to criticize David Wood. Have you noticed that when I posted some YouTube responses and articles refuting James White's interpretation of John 6, he was quick to say a former colleague, you know, who's left the faith that he's present, presented, pretty much turned his back against me for po basically posting these links criticizing him. So now notice. If you criticize James White and you present responses to his material, he takes that as an attack and you're no longer his co colleague. But when he attacks you, when he criticizes you, when he plays clips of you, that's okay. He's being a Christian holding you accountable to scripture. And so he goes on to attack David Wood and then he takes my statements to Muhammad Hijab out of context where it says Sam Shamoon challenges Muhammad Hijab to a fist fight, but doesn't give the context why, because Muhammad Hijab challenged me to fight and said, 
that he wouldn't debate me unless I fought him. But did you notice what he hasn't done? Notice what he hasn't done. <clears throat> Why is he awfully silent about Hatun getting beat up by a Muslim in Speaker's Corner? Why is he quick to attack Robert Spencer when Robert Spencer <clears throat> right, rightly exposed Yasser Qadi, his mentor, for his ties with Muslim Brotherhood, for mocking Jews and Christians, quoting him in context, he came to Yasser Qadi's aid and attacked Robert Spencer and vilified Robert Spencer and defended Yasser Qadi. Why is he quick to attack David Wood and me? But he is awfully silent about Hatun Tash, his sister in the Lord Jesus, who's putting her life on the line to expose Islam and terrorists and Muhammad for the glory of Jesus. He is completely silent. Can you tell me, am I wrong? Tell me, am I wrong? Tell me. Please, guys, I don't want you to just tickle my ears. Even if I don't like it, rebuke me. Where am I wrong? You have time to criticize my debate with Matt Slick. You have time to criticize Robert Spencer for rightly exposing Nasser Qadi, your mentor. You have time to criticize David Wood. And you have time to misrepresent me, saying that I challenged Muhammad Ajab to a fight when he challenged me. And you don't have time to say anything about your sister who got beat up in Speaker's Corner? No, it's time this man is exposed and put in his place. I have to say this. Brother James, Lord Jesus, have mercy on you and have mercy on me and save you and save me from going the path you went to. May he save us. But I can't condone it anymore. You are an enemy and a stumbling block. You need to be exposed and put in your place. And glory to Jesus. May the Lord use me to silence you, to expose you for being inept. And you're not the scholar you make yourself out to be. I have to be honest. It's time, folks. Right? Can you, can you convince me that my criticism of James White is wrong? And can you explain to me, those of you who still like him and support him, those of you who like him, why is he completely silent about what happened to Atun Tash? And I bet you now that he hears this, people are going to complain. He's going to say something to save face. Where am I wrong, guys? Where am I wrong? It's time. It's time and glory to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. I'm going to decimate his arguments for limited atonement. And I'm going to insist he debates me for the glory of Jesus. Because I promise you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, my trust in the Holy Spirit, not me, I will end his apologetic career when it comes to defending limited atonement. It will be over for him when we debate and the debate is over by the power of Jesus Christ, my confidence in my Lord. I promise you, right? Now that said, let me give you a few more articles. You remember this book that I held up yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Don't be barking in the comment section, tough guys. Call me on Skype so I can muzzle you guys as well. You remember this? I put this up yesterday. Let me let me show you this again. All right. Okay. You see this? Evangelical Exodus, edited by Doug Beaumont. Doug Beaumont is a graduate of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Southern Evangelical Seminary. Seminary started by Norm Geisler. He also was Norm Geisler's assistant, helping him to collect information for the systematic theology volumes that Norm Geisler produced. Doug Beaumont became a Roman Catholic. He edited this book, which contains essays by evangelicals that went to Southern Evangelical Seminary, why they left Protestantism and became Catholic, and Doug Beaumont also has a chapter explaining, though he studied under some of the greatest Protestant minds, like Norm Geisler, why he ended up becoming Roman Catholic. Now, the reason why I mentioned it is because Doug Beaumont is a whiz when it comes to logic. When it comes to philosophy and logic, he's a wizard. God has blessed him. He's a master of logic and philosophy. The reason why I say that is because he went after James White's exegesis of John 6, 44, and completely, 
and I say this, and I'm being honest, embarrassed James White. This is why James White was angry with me when I posted Doug Beaumont's response to James White's exegesis of John 6, 44. He took that as me attacking him. But when he criticizes us, that's not an attack. When he criticizes Christians, that's not an attack. He's being a Christian. But when I quote someone exposing why his exegesis is shallow, see, Sam turned on me. What are you talking about, man? Here it is. Here's the link. The first two posts, Doug Beaumont utterly decimates James White's exegesis of John 6, 44. It's right there. Here's the link. Click on it. Read his posts. Masterful. In fact, you got to know a thing about logic to follow his arguments because it's hard to follow. Now, with that said, this video also upset James White when I posted it. This kid, when I say kid because he's younger than me, he's a whiz too. The way he refutes arguments, he does it in a very – how do I say this? He, he does it with props, and he does it with jokes, and he does it with – and he can really get under your nerves if he's refuting you because he completely embarrasses you. And you guys know what I'm talking about, how to become a Christian. He's a Catholic apologist who did a response to James White in John 6, 44 that made James White go ballistic. James White destroys James White. That's the name of the video. James White destroys James White. Here it is. How to be a Christian. He's a Catholic. It was utterly embarrassing for James White. He takes clips showing James White contradicting himself <clears throat> and trying to defend himself. It was an embarrassment. Now, I posted that so people can get the other side and see the responses to James White so they can get both sides of the story, two different perspectives, and see which position makes a stronger case. And I have to tell you, Doug Beaumont, Leighton Flowers, and How to Be a Christian have decimated James White's interpretation, John 6, 44, in my mind. And Lord Jesus willing, in my upcoming responses, I will be refuting James White on John 6, 44, Lord willing. I'll be doing that. Now, this is the context. This is the background why I've decided to do the series, especially now that James White wants to respond to my debate with Matt Slick on his DL show, Dividing Line. It's a long time coming, and it's here. So are you ready to go into the meat of the matter? James White, his war with John Calvin on the atonement. I'm going to use John Calvin to refute James White. I'm going to use John Calvin to show you James White is not the scholar of the Greek New Testament that he makes himself out to be, though he tries to intimidate and bully people with his knowledge of Greek, I'm going to let John Calvin, his granddaddy, <clears throat> scold him, whip him, and discipline him, and put him on timeout. John Calvin is going to now put James White in his place and school him for us. Glory to Jesus Christ. Bart Ehrman, can you stop? I know you're a black Hebrew Israelite. Embarrassed that you don't know who your father is because when your mother got done doing muta with the 20 chia, she couldn't tell you who the, her dad, her, your daddy was. Get out of here, you wicked, filthy, satanic dog. I know I, I live in your head rent-free, you stupid, demonic bastard. Yep. There you go. Are we ready now? We're going to focus on John 3, 16 to 18. First, last, are you here? John 3, 16, 18. Okay, let's deal. Let's get into the meter. Now, help me to help you. Help me to help you. Don't let the demons distract you. Don't even engage them. They know to call me on Skype if they're really men so I can embarrass them live. And don't get into side talk, side issues, side tangents. Let's focus for the glory of Jesus Christ. Who's here? Is Protestant or first last year? I thought one of them was here to post. Okay, Protestant believer, you're here. You'll be able to stay for the remainder of the night. Another hour or so. I thought you were sleeping because I know you need a lot of beauty sleep. Protestant believer, John 3, 16, 18. Since James White likes the New American Standard Bible, let's use the New American Standard Bible. That's his preferred Bible. Protestant believer. By the way, McVine, what did you think of my debate with uh, Matt Slick, our brother? Now, for the record, guys, I love Matt Slick. And I would never disrespect that brother, even though I really dislike his harsh 
treatment of Catholics and Orthodox and his hatred of the Catholic Orthodox Church. There he's wrong in my view, but I love him. And I think, well, anyway, we'll keep it that way. All right, John 3, 16, 18. John 3, 16, 18. Protestant, are you here or did Joe Biden come in and take over? Guys, do me a favor. I don't want to shut down. I don't want to shut down my Skype. So don't contact me on Skype unless it's to debate me. So let me shut it down because people are Skyping me and people can hear the background noise. All right. I think Protestant believer Joe Biden took over. Make sure you don't vote for Sleepy Joe, Protestant, even though he's your twin brother. Thank you for this last. New American Standard Bible, let's read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I want you to pay attention to that phrase, whoever believes in him. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That the world might be saved through him. Now notice verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, what's the objection by James White? Let's go to John 3, 16 again. What's the objection by James White? Let's see. Let me show you the Greek. Now, I'm going to pronounce it the Erasmian way, right? The way they teach you in seminaries, the way James White would pronounce it, right? Ha, pas ha, pas on. Pas ha, pas on. All right. John 3, 16. This is where he tries to intimidate you with the Greek. This is where he tries to intimidate you with the Greek. And I'm going to let John Calvin obliterate his interpretation of the Greek. John 3, 16, notice what it said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's that phrase, whoever. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay, here's the link to the Greek. When you click on it, you're going to see that that word translated whoever. Okay, let me find it for you guys. <laughs> you know, because I, I'm so stupid, I'm reading right to left because I'm thinking it's Hebrew Greek. Okay, it's hinna, pas, ha, or ho, pistuon. Pas, ha, pistuon. Okay. Now, do you see it? It's pas, ha, pastuon. Okay, do you see there it says, if you look at it, it says, everyone believing. Everyone believing. Now, what does James White do with this? He says that pas, ha, pastuon, pastuon is a participle. If you look at it, it's a participle, a verbal adjective. The people are being described by their action, right? It's like saying the hitter, the boxer, right? You're describing the individual by their action, right? The hitter, the boxer, the dancer. So basically, that's what a participle is. You identify the person by the action he is known for committing, right? The dancer, the boxer, the kicker, right? The hitter, right? The lover. All right. So literally, you can render the Greek as all the believing ones. All the believing ones. Right? So what is James White trying to do? He's trying to show you it doesn't mean whoever believes. That whoever believes will be saved. He says, no, it's saying the believing ones will be saved. So what he's trying to get you to see you got to understand now, if you don't get the point, I can't refute him. Okay? What he's trying to get you to say is that the literal Greek isn't whoever believes, meaning it's up to you. You have the choice. If you believe, you'll be saved. The Greek literally says, he'll tell you, all the believing ones. So it's not saying whoever believes. It's not talking about if someone believes, he'll be saved. It's talking about the believing ones. <clears throat> they are the ones who will receive eternal life. They're the ones who'll be saved because they're the believing ones. Pas ha pistuon. Pas ha pistuon. Okay? So what is he trying to prove? He's trying to prove that John 3.16 is not talking about 
God's desire for everyone to believe. What John 3.16 is talking about is that God sent Jesus to save the Jews and the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, <clears throat> specifically all those believing ones from the Jews and Gentiles, that's who Jesus came for. So what he's trying to get you to see is the world doesn't mean every single individual. The world means all the nations, but he doesn't come to save every person from all the nations. He comes to save all the believing ones from all the nations so that Jesus didn't just come to save the believing ones from Israel. He came to save all the believing ones from all the nations. That's how he's trying to interpret it. And that's exactly... That's exactly what Matt Slick said in the debate with me. If you go back and listen, he goes, I didn't say everyone. I, I know you didn't say that, Matt. I know you're saying that Jesus comes to save all the believing ones from all the nations. Not every individual, but all the believing ones from all the nations, not just from Israel. You're right? So you see how he's trying to interpret it? He's trying to tell you it's not an invitation, like the brother said, for everyone to believe, receive, and be saved. No. God loved all nations, not just Jews. And because of that, Jesus comes to save all the believing ones from all the nations so that the believing ones won't just be from Israel. The believing ones will be from all nations because Jesus came to save all the believing ones from all the nations. I don't know why it's unclear. I just repeated it again. Everyone there? Do you understand what he means? Now I'm going to use James White to refute James White and John Calvin to destroy James White's butchering of the Greek. Are you ready now? If you got the point, I can now go to the refutation. Ready? Is anyone still confused? I'll repeat it again. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to enable me to accurately represent his position because unfortunately I bought into his rhetoric and I use his exegesis, which is eisegesis. Right? So are you ready now? Here's James White's book, The Forgotten Trinity. The first edition, the second edition. Second edition. Okay, you ready? Second edition. In the first edition, if you have the first edition, write pages 48 and 104. Pages 48 and 104. Okay, you with me there? In the first edition, we're going to be looking at pages 48 and 104, first edition. Second edition, it's pages 44 and 103. Pages 44 and 103. Okay, I need you guys to focus. If you're ready, we're going to go into some serious meat. And this will be an ongoing series where James White and his bullying tactics are put to bed. Okay. Second edition. Now I want you to see what James White says about the prologue of John. What's the prologue of John? John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. The prologue of John. The next heretic that I'm going to have to school after I'm done with James White is David Wood. We need to put him in his place because he's even worse and more dangerous than James White. And we need to put, stand up to this bully and put him in his place. So after my series, the next series will be David Wood being schooled by his daddy. Many a booch. All right. Now, with that said, and for those of you who don't know, it's because Hater Wood's in my channel. Why don't you send me some 400 of your bored to death viewers so that can they can watch me? Okay. Now, here we go. Page 44. Page 44. What does James White say about the prologue of the Gospel of John? What's the prologue? Pay attention. The prologue is the title given to John chapter 1, verses 118. John chapter 1, verses 118 is called the prologue because that is John's introduction to the Gospel and the themes that he will be covering in the Gospel. So the prologue serves as the lens that John wants you to use in order to read and properly interpret the rest of the gospel, right? 
What does James White say about the prologue? Are you ready? And I'm going to show you he's blatantly inconsistent. He doesn't follow his own advice. You ready? Okay, here it is, page 44. Few passages of Scripture are more important to our study of the Trinity, and in particular of the person of the Son, than the prologue of John. You see, John clearly intended this passage to function as a lens. James White's words. A window of sorts through which we are to read the rest of his gospel. If we stumble here, if we stumble at the prologue, we are in danger of missing so much of the richness that is to be found in the rest of the book. And it's ironic, he does exactly the opposite of what he advises people to do, which is why he stumbles. But if we, if we work hard, if we work hard to grasp John's meaning here, many other passages will open up for us of their own accord. Did you pay attention? If you work hard to understand the prologue, many other passages in the Gospel of John will open up for us of their own accord, yielding tremendous insights into the heart of God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. Okay, that was page 44. Page 103. Page 103. Here it goes. I have an underline. We have asserted that John intends the entire gospel to be read through the interpretive window of the prologue of chapter 1, verses 118. Let me repeat. Please, guys, pay attention. It's going to show you how you're going to use James White's words to literally destroy limited atonement. No kidding. His words will end up destroying his interpretation of John in support of limited atonement. Glory to the triune God. Let me repeat it again. We have asserted that John intends the entire gospel to be read through the interpretive window of the prologue of chapter 1, verses 118. This is where David and I can say, Surprise, James. Surprise, Rich. Bye-bye. Okay, did you hear that right? From the horse's mouth, right? From the horse's mouth, correct? You know why? It's wonderful. Guys, I'm excited right now. I feel like dancing. Let me tell you why. Did you know every theme in John 1 do you, do you know, when you make me a mod on your channel, Hater Wood, I'll make you a mod. But you're too scared to make me a mod because, you know, I'm going to block all those nuisances, you coward. You cowardly white dictator, hater. You make me a mod, I'll make you a mod. All right. Now, did you know, did you know, every theme in John 1 is touched upon in John 3? Every theme in John 1 is touched upon in John 3. Everything John says in John 1 is elaborated in John chapter 3. And did you know, because of that, there's no way you can argue that John 3.16 is referring only to the believing ones. John 3.16 is referring to the entire human race, that God loves the entire human race, and wants the entire human race to be saved. Do you know that? Are you ready for that? Are you ready? I'm re okay, if you're ready, I'm ready to unpack it. Okay, John 1. John 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's unpack it. Everything mentioned in the prologue is elaborated on in John 3. Let's see if you make the connection. John 1, verses 4 and 5. John 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's do it. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not com comprehended. In him was life, the life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness, the darkness could not comprehend it. Remember that. John 1, 7. 
and John 1 9, John 1 7, and John 1 9. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So notice, Jesus is the light that comes into the world, the true light that lightens every man, and that light shined in the darkness. Now, is that mentioned in John 3? Let's go to John 3, 19 to 21. John 3, 19 to 21. If you're not paying attention, you're going to miss all this meat. Wagyu steak, like my brother said. Right? John 3, 19 to 21. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Oh, wow. The light has come into the world. Sound familiar? That's the prologue. And men love the darkness rather than the light. Oh, wow. The light shines in the darkness for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Oh, wow. Light shines in darkness. Darkness doesn't comprehend it. The true light that lightens every man came into the world. That's mentioned in John 3. Okay, now let's look at John the Baptist. John 1, 6 to 8. John the Baptist. Pay attention, guys. John 1, 6 to 8. John the Baptist. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Okay, now let's look at John 1.15. John 1.15. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So John is sent to bear witness to Jesus being the light. Do we find that theme in John 3? Yes. John 3, 22 to 30. John 3, 22 to 30. Watch where we're going with this. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anan near Salem, because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. <whistles> he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Okay. Do you find that theme in the prologue mentioned in John 3? John sent to bear witness and testify Jesus is the light and he's coming. Right? So that theme is in John 3. But hold on. We got more. John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God. Does John 3 touch on the theme of being born of God? Oh, yeah. John 3, verse 3. John 3, verse 7. John 3, verse 3. John 3, verse 7. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do not be amazed that I said to you, must be born again. Oh, wow. Born of God, born again. John sent to bear witness of Jesus. The light that lightens every man, the true light, came into the world, and their darkness could not comprehend it. 
Do you see all the themes of John 1 are in John 3? Yeah, please do hit the like button. Now, why is this relevant to John 3, 16 and 17? Here's why. Let's read John 3, 16 and 17 so you see why. Watch here. You got it, Alex. Alex Gaskin, I want to kiss your head. Interpret lens of John 1, James' own words, the world is the same. Okay, now pay attention to the world. Pay attention to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send the son into the world, into the world, the son did not come into the world, to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now get ready for the obliteration of James White's shameful butchering of John 3. Are you ready? Thank you, James. You just destroyed your own argu ar argument. Thank you. And I'm going to use John Calvin to further destroy your argument. Thank you, James. Surprise, Rich. John 1, 9 to 10. Here's why. John 1, 9 to 10. Let's see if you catch it. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Booyah shaka. Bye bye. The world that God sent his son into to save is the world that he made. Who's excluded? You got it, Alex. The world, every man. Who's excluded? Angie, who's excluded? The true light came into the world that he brought into being, who enlightens every man. And why did he come into the world? To save it. Who's excluded? I want to let, give you a second to sink in. Yeah, I thought our sister, oh, Angie's there. She, she, she's here. Angie, you used to believe in limited atonement. Are you seeing if you let the Bible speak for itself and not put on the Calvinist lens? It is inarguable, irrefutably established that the world that God sent his son into to save is the world that he brought into being who is excluded. That's why John 1, 9 says he's the true light that lightens every man. And who told me, who told me to interpret John in light of the prologue? Who told me? Who told me to interpret John in light of the prologue? Let me read it again. Here you go. 103. So why doesn't he practice what he preach? Why doesn't he follow his own advice? Why does he abandon the lens of the prologue when it comes to John 3? Because of his man-made tradition that he swears by. So it's not tota scriptura, a sola scriptura. That's a lie. So he pays lip service to it. Sorry, James. I have to call a spade a spade. You're paying lip service to scripture. Okay, here you go. 103. We have asserted that John intends the entire gospel to be read through the interpretive window of the prologue of 1, chapter 1, verses 118. It's okay, Angie. Look what Angie H. said. I am sorry I believe this. Better late than never. Glory to Jesus Christ that he's guiding us, guiding you into all truth. May save you and us from all error to die to all man-made tradition and accept the scriptures the way the Holy Spirit wants those scriptures to be accepted. God bless you, Angie H. You're not the only one. I'm sorry I bought into it too. And may many more come out for the glory of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, bring them to the fullness of your truth and have mercy on those who are still caught into this. Okay, now, let's look at John 1. 9 to 10, one more time. Hold on. Well, here, let's look at... Yep. Let's look at John 1. 
7 to 10. John 1, 7 to 10. John 1, 7 to 10. One more time. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. All might believe through him. Did God want only some to believe through John's message? Or he wanted everyone that heard John's message to believe? What did God want? Only the elect to believe John's message? Or did he want everyone that heard John's message to believe? Everyone that heard John, God's desire was that through John, everyone that hears him believes. Okay, that's number one. Okay, now watch here. That's number one. <clears throat> he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Does Jesus only enlighten some or every man? Now, James says, well, he's, he enlightens every sort of, of man, every kind of man. That's refuted by verse 10. You know how I know it's refuted by verse 10? He was in the world and the world was made through him. Did Jesus only make all kinds of men, all types of men, or he made all men, period? All men, period, right? Because of verse 10, the world came into being through him. Now, let me read to you this exposition. This exposition of John 1 that we just read, this exposition of John 1, verses 9 to 11. Okay. He quotes Augustine's view that all men means all kinds of men, much like James White. But now let me read what he says. Are you ready? Watch here. Let me read what he says. Okay. I am more inclined to adopt the other meaning, which is that from this light, the rays are diffused over all mankind, as I have already said. So this authority says, I don't agree with Augustine. Who says all kinds of men are enlightened? No. The light of Jesus has been diffused over all mankind. So that all mankind has received illumination to some degree from the light of Christ. You know that was? John Calvin. Here you go. Here's the article. That's John Calvin. There you go. John Calvin agrees with us. And refutes James White. John Calvin. There's the link. Click on my article. That's John Calvin. It's there, free of charge, produced for your benefit and blessing. Booyah, Kasha. It's right there. All right. Okay, now, let's go to back to John 3.16. Let's now refute. James White's shallow understanding of Greek. And I'm going to use John Calvin to refute him. So this bullying tactic where he tries to appeal to Greek to intimidate us ain't working, my brother. Try it on somebody else. It's not going to work with us. It's not going to work with John Calvin either. Okay. John 3.16. Okay. Right here. Let's look at it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, remember what James White claims about the Greek phrase. Here it is. Here's the link. Here's the link. Okay, let me show you. Okay, here. Click on that link again. The phrase is pas ha pistuon. Pas Ha pistuon. Literally, all the believing ones. So what James White is trying to say is, the Greek is not saying whoever believes. It's not an invitation to people to believe so that whoever believes will be saved. It's simply saying that all the believing ones will be saved. So you understand his argument, right? Now, let me tell you why a little Greek is a dangerous thing. Now, James White has no excuse. You know why? Because he boasts that he reads the Greek and he taught Greek. He taught Greek at Golden Gate Baptist, was it seminary? 
So he talks about, he taught Greek. So he's passing himself off as a scholar of the Greek. So his butchering of the Greek is inexcusable. Okay. Now understand what the argument is again. He says that the Greek literally says all the believing ones. It doesn't say whoever believes. The Greek literally says, pas ha pistuon, all the believing ones. Because he doesn't want the Greek to say whoever believes. Okay, are you guys ready for the refutation? Are you ready for the refutation? Why then do most, if not all, legitimate translations render pas ha pistuon as whoever? Why is it these Greek scholars, scholars of the Greek New Testament, that's what I mean by Greek scholars, not that they're native Greek speakers, why is it that most, if not all, translations render pas ha pistuon as whoever as opposed to all the believing ones? What are they not seeing that James White sees or what are they seeing that James White does not see? Let me tell you why it's rendered whoever believes. Okay. The idea of the Greek phrase, pay attention, pas ha pastuon. The idea is that Jesus came to procure the salvation of the world so that everyone that believes will be saved. In other words, the idea isn't he only came to save the believing ones. The idea is because he's now procured the salvation of the world, now if you believe, you'll be saved. The idea of the Greek isn't that Jesus came to save the believing ones. The idea is since he now procured the salvation of the world, everyone that now believes will be saved because Christ has earned the salvation of the world. You understand my point? The idea in the Greek isn't that Jesus comes to save the believing ones. The idea is... Because Jesus saved the world by his perfect life of obedience and death, now all those who are believing from the world can be saved. Let me know if I'm confusing you. Yes, Angie. He procured redemption. He accomplished the redemption of the world, but you must be believing to receive it. Okay, I just want you to understand the idea of the Greek phrase, pas ha pistuon, pas ha pistuon. And I'm going to show you contextually, the meaning isn't that Jesus comes to save the believing ones from all the nations. The meaning is, since Jesus has saved the world, now all those who are believing, anyone who comes to believe can be saved. Now, I don't know why Mark James is calling me. Maybe it's a challenger so I can put him in his place. And I'm going to now prove this is the meaning. Just be patient with me, guys. This is why I hope James White debates me. Go and challenge him. Say, James White, Sam Shimon wants you to debate limited atonement. He's calling you out. You need to put Sam Shimon in his place. Please, you are a champion. Refute him. He's got to debate me. Who's this guy, Mark, calling me? Oh, let me see. It may be a satanic distraction. I'll get rid of them in a minute. Hold on. Oh, we got a stupid dog that's barking. Mark James. Watch what I'm going to do to this guy. Yeah, you filthy coward. Keep barking and don't pick up. No, you're going to pick up right now. You're not going to call me right back. You're picking up now. I'm wasting my time like the son of the devil. Come on, Mark James. Acting tough in the comment section. Hurry up. Fool of the devil this track. Oh. Yeah, they're all brave in the comment section. Sorry, guys. That's why I'm wearing Bruce Lee. Okay, yeah. Yeah. You wicked, vile tool of the devil. Use of the devil, your father distract. That's why I treat you guys the way. There. 
That's it. Don't be calling me, guys, unless you want me to block you. Don't be calling me unless you want me to be blocking you. Okay. Hold on. Let's see. He called again. I try it. Okay. Hold on, guys. Sorry, guys. Bear with me because I got to school some of these rabid dogs of the devil. They're acting brave. Sorry about that. Sorry, folks. Please bear with me. This is part of it, you know, the territory. Let's see. So let's see. Larry, don't call me right now. Let me finish my discussion. Then you can call me. Don't call me right now. Wait till I'm done with the discussion. Okay. Now, with that said, you guys got the point. I gave you a few minutes for it to sink in. What's the idea behind John 3.16? Let me repeat because I'm going to give you contextual proof. James White is butchering the Greek, and he's hoping he can intimidate you with his feigned knowledge of Greek. Okay. The idea behind John 3.16 isn't that Jesus came to save the believing ones. The idea is because God sent Jesus to the world to save it, now the believing ones will be saved as a result of Jesus accomplishing the redemption of the world. So the idea is Christ has accomplished the redemption of the world. As a result of him accomplishing the redemption of the world, everyone that's now believing will be saved. Do you understand the difference? And that's what John 3.17 says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. In other words, the reason why most, if not all, translators render pas, ha, pastoan as whoever, because they know contextually that's the point of John. John's point in using the phrase pas, Ha Pistuon is to show because of Jesus saving the world, now everyone that believes will be saved. It's not saying he only came to save the believing ones. He came to save the world, and because he's accomplished the salvation of the world, now everyone that believes in him will be saved. That's why they render it as whoever believes. Right? Guys, I want to tell you something. I'm going to be emailing him. Bill Mounts. William Mounts, he has a YouTube channel. Don't take my word for it. Bill Mounts, he wrote a grammar on Greek, New Testament. His grammar on Greek, New Testament is used in colleges and seminaries. He's got a YouTube channel where he goes through the Greek, New Testament and breaks it down. Okay, let me show you. I saw him at the Evangelical, Theological, and the Philosophical Society in November of 2019. James White did some DL shows critiquing Bill Mounts' interpretation of John 3.16. Now, Bill Mounts doesn't know who James White is. He's too busy, you know, doing research and writing scholarly tomes to take notice of James White. Now, I want you to see his YouTube channel because I asked him a question. Okay. Here it is. Subscribe to it and watch. Here he is. Bill Mounts. He's a legitimate scholar of the Greek New Testament. Bill Mounts. He wrote a grammar on the basic Greek grammar of the New Testament. Okay, here it is. Folks, the Lord bears witness if I'm lying. I asked him. I go, Professor Mounts, there's someone going around saying that in John 3.16, pas ha pistuon means all the believing ones, not whoever believes. You know what he did? You know what he said to me? The Lord bear witness. And I'm going to email him, see if he'll give me permission to quote him. You know what he said? You guys want to hear what he said? Straight face looked at me. I didn't want to mention the name. You know what he said? The person who said that doesn't know Greek. The person who said that doesn't know Greek. That's what he told me. He told me that. The Lord knows if I'm lying. And I smirked. I laughed. I laughed. I smirked. I didn't want to tell him who it was. I go, thank you, sir. God bless you. Now, part of my series, I will be contacting him, God willing. Lord Jesus willing, I'll be contacting him and ask him his opinion about anyone who says, pas ha pustuon doesn't mean whoever. 
And I'm going to ask him if I can quote him and read out his response, if he responds, God willing. Now, do you know who agrees with Bill Mounts? Do you know who agrees with Bill Mounts that James White doesn't know Greek, though he claims to know Greek? So don't be bullied by his feigned knowledge of Greek. Do you know who else? Let me read to you who else. Are you ready? Remember, James White says, Pas ha pastone isn't whoever. It's all the believing ones. Okay, let me read it to you. You ready? Let me get there. All right. One second. Okay, here you go. You ready? Are you ready? You guys ready for the quote? There you go. That whosoever believeth on him may not perish. It is a remarkable com commendation of faith that it frees us from everlasting destruction for he intended expressly to state that though we appear to have been born to death, undoubted deliverance is offered to us by the faith of Christ. Now watch here. Get ready to be blown away. And therefore, that we ought not to fear death, which otherwise hangs over us. And he, John, has employed the universal term, whosoever, both to invite all indiscriminately to partake of life and to cut off every excuse from unbelievers, such is also the import of the term world, which he formerly used. For though nothing will be found in the world that is worthy of the favor of God, yet he shows himself to be reconciled to the whole world when he invites all men without exception to the faith of Christ, which is nothing else than an entrance into life. John Calvin. Those are the words of John Calvin in my article, on John Calvin's commentary on the Gospel of John, John 3, 16 to 17. John Calvin. And he's employed the universal term, whosoever, both to invite all indiscriminately to partake of life. Shame on you, James White, for trying to intimidate people with your knowledge of Greek and bully them and passing yourself off as an expert of Greek to rob what the text says, a text that so clearly speaks that God's desire is a salvation for every man, so clear, in fact, that even John Calvin sees it and refutes you. Shame on you, James White. It's time for you to find something else because you're doing great damage and you become an embarrassment to apologetics. Shame on you. You got it? Here's my article again. The material I prepared for Matt Slick. Calvin never started limited atonement, Coco. That started after him. Did you catch it? Let me read it again if you didn't catch it. Here's what John Calvin said of John 3.17. Here's what John Calvin said of John 3.17. That whosoever believeth on him may not perish. It is a remarkable commendation of faith that it frees us from everlasting destruction. For he intended expressly to state that though we appear to have been born to death, undoubted deliverance, this is John 3.16, I'm sorry, it's this commentary on John 3.16. My apologies. This is what he's saying about John 3.16 where the term whosoever is used. Lord Jesus saved me from error, but it's all there in that article. And I also quote him on John 3.17, but now, and he's employed the universal term, whosoever. He has employed the universal term, whosoever, both to invite all indiscriminately to partake of life and to cut off from every excuse from unbelievers. You see what John is saying? John Calvin is saying, unbelievers, you have no excuse. You cannot say that Jesus doesn't want you to be saved. You cannot say that Jesus didn't die for you to save you because Jesus says in his gospel, whosoever, he's inviting all men, everyone, the whole world, indiscriminately, without exception. So why don't you turn and be saved? Now let me read that last part of John 3.16 and then I'm going to read to you what he says about John 3.17. 
And I'll give you the link to Calvin's commentary online, translate in English, right? Such is also the import of the term world, which he formerly used, for though nothing will be found in the world that is worthy of the favor of God, no one deserves the favor of God in the world. Yet he, God, shows himself to be what? Angie, listen, John Calvin, yet he shows himself to be reconciled to the whole world when he invites all men, without exception, to the faith of Christ. Now notice this paragraph. Let us remember, on the other hand, that while life is promised universally to all, God has promised life universally to all who believe in Christ. You see? He wants all to believe in Christ because his promises to the whole world all men, without exception, still faith is not common to all. For Christ is made known and held out to the view of all, though he's held out for everyone, but the elect alone are they whose eyes God opens that they may seek him by faith. Let me repeat Angie H.'s words. Glory to the triune God. Rejoice with our sister, Angie H., let me quote verbatim, Angie H., I'm free from limited atonement prison. Glory to Jesus, even though I'm not saying it's a damnable teaching, there are many true believers, brother, sister, who believe in it. I'd rather see people be freed from it and accept the fullness of the truth of the gospel. May they all come to it in Jesus' name like you and I came out of it to the truth of the gospel. Glory to Jesus Christ, Angie H. Let me read your words again. I'm free from limited atonement prison. So am I, Angie. Now here's what John Calvin says about John 3.17. I'll read the last part. The word world is again repeated that no man may think himself wholly excluded if he only keep the road of faith. Only the elect John Calvin? No. The reason why... John repeats the term world in verse 17, according to Calvin, that no man may think himself wholly excluded if he only keep the road of faith. Thank you, John Calvin. Now, in case you guys don't believe me, here's the link to John Calvin's commentary online for free. Here it is. Here it is. Click on it and go read it for yourself. Now, can I ask you guys a question? Can I ask you a question? Are you ready for the question? Even James White admits John Calvin is one of the greatest scholars. Brilliant. Who knew the biblical languages and his commentaries are phenomenal, su superb. And I know James White is not that arrogant. Now, maybe he is to say that he's on the level of John Calvin. Because John Calvin would bury James White in <clears throat> his knowledge of the biblical languages and exegesis of the scriptures. What did John Calvin see in the Greek words, pas ha pistuon, that James White does not see. Since John Calvin knows the Greek better than James White could dream of, why did John Calvin say the phrase pas ha pistuon is universal? It means whoever, anyone that wants to believe is invited to believe. How come he saw that? James White doesn't. And what does it tell you when James White appeals to the Greek to intimidate you when nothing in the Greek supports James White's position? And how do I know nothing in the Greek supports his position? John Calvin knew the Greek better than him and says James White, indirectly, because James White wasn't alive at that time, doesn't know what he's talking about. Bill Mounts, another scholar of the Greek New Testament, recognized as a Greek scholar. James White is the only one who claims to be a scholar of the Greek. Bill Mounts, on the other hand, wrote a book on Greek grammar in the New Testament, is considered a bona fide scholar of the Greek New Testament, and is on the translation committee of the NIV. When I told him 
There's someone who says, pas ha pistuon doesn't mean whosoever or whoever. Shouldn't be translated such, but it should mean all, all the believing ones. He said, he doesn't know Greek. You catch it now? It's about time we put James White in his place. Leighton Flowers, wonderful job. He's been doing it for years. A thorn in his side, right? How to Become a Christian is doing it. <clears throat> Dr. David Allen is doing it. I'm going to now do my part because I'm sorry. Until he repents, he's of no use anymore. He's doing more damage to the kingdom than good. I have to be honest. I love the brother. I'm not saying he's not saved. But the discipline of God will fall on him if he doesn't repent. And may the Lord Jesus save me from that path so I don't shame the Lord because I don't want to end up like that. Please, Lord Jesus. Please. All right? Have mercy on all of us, even on James White. Purify my heart for your glory. Okay, now, another decimation of the argument, pas ha pustone means the, all the believing ones, that Jesus only came to save all the believing ones from all the nations. Not that he came to save the entire human race so that the believing ones can be saved because Jesus came to procure the salvation of the entire human race. That's what James White wants you to believe. Let me show you now the burial of this argument, and I'll move on to other arguments by James White and show you none of them prove his man-made tradition of particular redemption. And it is a man-made tradition that you must force into the scripture and butcher the scripture to arrive at that doctrine. Let me call a spade a spade. John 3.18. Do you want the funeral for this argument? Are you ready now to attend the funeral service for James White's argument? Here goes. John 3.18. John 3.18. Here goes. He who, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Now pay attention. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, guys, let's go to the Greek. Because James White likes to go to the Greek. But for some reason, he doesn't comment on this. At least, not often. And I don't recall him commenting on this. I want you to click on the Greek. You don't need to read the Greek to see. Okay? You, because they provide the Greek in transliteration. Okay. Do you see the phrase, ha pastuon? It's the believing ones. Ha pastuon is or is auton? U Krinitai. Krinitai. So it's the believing ones. But guess what James White doesn't tell you? Do you see the phrase, but de me pistuon? De me pistuon? You know what that is? That too is a participle. It's the not believing ones. The believing ones are not judged. The not believing ones are judged. So what does that mean? How does the participle impact the fact that the believing ones are condemned because they don't believe and the believing ones are saved because they believe? How does the participle impact the exegesis that the believing ones are thus described because they've come to believe and therefore are saved, but the not believing ones are condemned because they didn't come to believe, which is why they're condemned. What does the participle have anything to do with the plain point of the passage? If you are believing, you won't be condemned because you believed and received. But if you're not believing, you're condemned because you don't want to believe. Implication? God wants you to believe, but you choose not to believe, you're condemned. The believing ones are saved because they chose to believe. That's all it's saying. Can you get Spenia out of here? Spenia, you got to get out of here. You're a nuisance and a thorn man. You got to get out of here.
But now here's the nightmare for James White. John 3.18. I've said then, you can translate everything I own in any language. Now here's the nightmare for James White. And I want you to ask anyone who believes in particular redemption this question. I asked Matt Slick this question. He had no answer. He didn't. Hopefully when James White agrees to debate with me, I'm going to hold his feet to the fire. And I'm going to ask him this question. Guys, pay attention to this. John 3.18. Okay. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Why are they condemned in John 3.18? Because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, right? Get this argument, folks. Get this argument. Don't forget this argument. They're condemned because they have not believed in the name of the Son of God. Now, I'm really confused, Angie. And everyone else. Why is God condemning them for not believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God if the only begotten Son of God only came to save the believing ones, the elect from the nations, and not the whole human race? Why are the unbelieving ones being condemned for not believing in the only begotten Son of God if the only begotten Son of God wasn't given for their salvation? Good, Angie H. You were wondering that because the Holy Spirit was working in your mind and heart to show you how unbiblical this doctrine is and a perversion of Scripture. Haim, you're not answering the question. Already condemned for what reason? Their sins or for not believing in the name of the only begotten Son? So him, him say. Explain to me, why are they condemned already for not believing in the name of the only begotten Son when the only begotten Son wasn't given for their salvation? Don't tap dance around that. Not believing what? Him's sake. You're about to get blocked if you're going to tap dance and disgust me with your shameful butchering of Scripture. Not believing what? And you'll be a proof of what man-made tradition does makes you pervert scripture to your shame and humiliation. This is why this doctrine disgusts me. And I used to do what you used to do. Thank the Lord he set me free. They're condemned for not believing what, him? Okay, thank you. Now you're honest and I'll kiss your head. God bless you. So then the question remains, why are they condemned for not believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God when the Son of God was never given for their salvation if James White is right. You get my point? He's not. Now, let's put the icing on the cake. And Lord willing, in part two, I'm going to refute his eisegesis of John 6.44. I promise, Lord willing. Okay, good him. You're scaring me for a minute, brother. Because you sounded almost like a five-point Calvinist, but God bless you, my brother. Thank the Lord. Because I don't want people to butcher scripture that bothers me to no end. Okay, final one, guys. Final one. Are you ready? John 12, 31. No, he would say it's enough to save all, but he didn't die to save all. He only died to save the elect, and he's off only offered for the elect. John 12, 31. Now the judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now can I ask you a question? Satan is the ruler of the world. Until and unless you're born of the Spirit. Is there someone who's born in the world that's not under Satan's control? The control and influence of the kingdom of darkness? Anyone who's born of the world, until unless they believe in Christ, until unless they believe in Christ, they're under the authority of Satan, the ruler of this world. And the only way they can escape is to turn to Christ, right? Okay. John 12, 31, 32. Let's look at it one more time. And I'm going to deal with James White's butchering of John 12, 30, 32, and John 6, 44 in the next part, God willing, sometime this week. 
John 12, 31 and 32. Now the judgment is upon this world. Now the world, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Resulting in what? When the ruler of this world is cast out, and I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Okay. In the context, when Jesus says he'll draw all men to himself, who are the all men in the context? Those of the world, right? Who are under bondage to the ruler of this world, right? In the context, the all men must be referring to all those in the world in John 12, 31. The world under Satan's influence. Now Satan's condemned, cast out, resulting in Christ now drawing all men who are in that world, who are tyrannized by Satan, to salvation in him so they can escape the snares of the devil. There you go. Now prove to me James White's man-made tradition of particular redemption is scriptural. It's not. Lord willing, I will deal with his attempt of explaining away John 12, 32 by his eisegesis of John 6, 44, a passage I too used to misinterpret like he did due to the influence of Calvinism. That will be in part two, Lord willing. Now I have some people calling me. Let's see if they're genuine questions. If not, I'll just block them and muzzle them and we'll end the session. Now, before I pick up, before uh, Larry, I'm going to block you. Larry Sempton, you're the first guy I'm going to block because you're an imp impatient troll. I'm going to be blocking you, Larry. Keep calling me so I can block you. Was that clear, the presentation I made, the reason why I'm not going after James White? Was that clear, the reason and the presentation? And did you see positive evidence? James White is not the scholar of the New Testament that he claims to be. And he's not the scholar of the Greek New Testament that he claims to be. Clear proof. And did you see I use John Calvin, a greater scholar than him, his spiritual forebear, to show he doesn't know the Greek as well as he thinks? So save the article from John Calvin. Use John Calvin to show, wait, I won't debate you. John Calvin debates you. John Calvin, what does world mean in John 129? What does world mean in John 1, 9 to 11? What does world mean in John 3, 16, 17? What does pas ha pastuon mean in John 3, 16, John Calvin? Go ahead. You refute James White and the hyper-Calvinists like him, the high Calvinists like him. Yeah, here it goes. Let me give it to you. Here it is. Let John Calvin refute them. Let John Calvin, their spiritual forebear, embarrass them and show that they're perverting the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, if you did your thesis, then God bless you and good for you, but don't advertise for yourself. Let someone else advertise for you. And if that's you, Larry, then don't call me. Let's see. Let's see. If you're trolls, you're going to get blocked right away. Blocked right away. If you're trolls. Yeah. Okay. Troll number one. Troll number one. All right. Let's see if this troll number two. Okay. So that was it. No call. Hold on. Let's see. Okay. So this guy didn't want to call. I didn't get it. All right. Logan, do you have a question? You want me to call you? I don't get it. Let me see. Yo, did you have a question? Yeah, I did actually have a question. All right, you're driving? You answer for me. Are you driving? Uh, no, well, no, I'm sit just sitting in my car. What's up? I don't want to go in my uh, 
build my house. Okay, but um, my my question is because I'm I'm Eastern Orthodox. Okay. Um, I was told by my priest that, and, may, and maybe this kind of fits in with what you're saying that when Christ died and resurrected, he basically like reset kind of the world and everything is being like all of creation is being resurrected. He's right. Yeah. Including people, but we have a free will choice, you know, to participate in that or not. I was just wondering. If no, you, yeah. He's spot on. Your priest was spot on brother. Okay, cool. I, I was just curious about that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give you references. <clears throat> Romans Is 8, your Romans 8, make sure you read Romans 8, 14. You can read all the way to 39, but it's particularly Romans. So remember, Romans 8, 14 to 39, but particularly read Romans 8, 18 to 25. It's the recreation, the resurrection, the restoration of humans who believe in Christ and the whole creation. So he's absolutely right. Awesome. Thank you. Could, uh, I, just have, I do have one more question. Go ahead, brother, go ahead. So, yeah. Um, I, I come from a place where there's a lot of, you know, Calvinists oh boy. around. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. To Orthodox. And, oh, so they um, converted to Orthodox? Those... Hold on. They converted to Orthodox? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually uh, converted to Antiochian Orthodox. Right. You were a Calvinist? They... Uh, I'm sorry. Were you a Calvinist? Um, yeah, I was, I was wow. big into Calvinism. I was, uh, really big into John MacArthur and all oh, of those guys. Oh. And um, I not, not, I'm, I don't want to, you know, really give my back. No, it's okay. No, no. I just was curious because believe it or not. And I know a lot of Calvinists dislike this. Many people who become Calvinists don't last droves leave right. after years. I'm talking about right. a mass exodus. And I happen to be one of them. Right. Layton flowers is one of them. Bobby Conway is one of them. Michael Brown and a host of others. It just it just so happens that in the beginning, you catch the Calvinist bug and you think it's so biblical. Then as you spend more right. time mature, you see it's very unbiblical. And then mass exodus of people, they leave. Well, well yeah, that, that's that's spot on. And, you know, because I, I don't want to, like, talk too much about me because yeah, okay. this isn't about me. But, um, you know, I was big into Calvinism. Um, and I, I just, I had a really big problem with the Calvinist God because he seemed very angry to me. He yes. seemed very upset yes. and like, he just kind of wanted to murder us all. Yeah. Um, so I actually went away from Christianity for a short time and was almost got involved in Satanism and paganism. Okay. And, before you uh, don't one, go too fast, brother. Slow down. Oh, sorry. I want people to hear the impact and how God saved you. Did you guys hear what this young so, man said? He just said the the Calvinist God seemed too angry and want to murder everyone, and then he fell away. And then what did you embrace? Uh, Satanism. And uh, I was huge into um, a type of music called called black metal. Wow. Um, where a lot of the bands and they came out of Norway in the nineties, but a lot of those bands burnt down churches and did a lot of really satanic things. And one day I was working my job, excuse me, I was working my job and I just felt a great desire to start reading church history it came out of nowhere. Amen. And, and I started reading it and then a friend some guy, uh, I was on this uh, Facebook group uh, with about like metal, and some guy that was from Romania that I didn't even know sent a link to this website called Death to the World, which is um, an Orthodox Christian website geared towards metalheads into metal, uh, into into you know like said that satanic music, and. I looked at this website and something about it caught my eye. I didn't know what it was at the time. I didn't know what I was even looking at. I was looking at, you know, pictures of these old monks. They'd have skulls and like, and they, there's something about them. They just look so holy. And I had believed when I was a Calvinist 
that monks were like unbiblical and wrong yeah. monasticism. Yeah. And I started, you know, reading, they have a whole bunch of articles on there and I started reading it and long story short, you know, I, I, um, just absolutely fell in love with the orthodoxy. But part of the reason I did was the fact that in orthodoxy, God doesn't want to kill anyone. Amen. God wants to save us. And Amen. one of the stories that I, and I think about this almost brings me to tears is one of the church fathers is talking about Christ, right? You know, the story where Christ is getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead, right? Yes. And it says, and there's that part in John, it says, Jesus wept. Yeah, man. Right, it's the shortest verse in the Bible. Okay, yes. the church father he he tells us, he says, "Why did Jesus weep?" He said, "Did did he weep for Lazarus?" And he says, "No." Wow. He said, "Because he knew he would raise him from the dead." He said, "He was weeping for us. You know, he was but, weeping for um, all mankind, because he knows that one day we will die." Yeah. And he said, "And that saddens God." And when I read that. I burst into tears. Hallelujah. Because I, I remember saying, like, who is this God? Yes. That, that that he cares about me. Yes. And and I just the the just some of the stories about these saints and some of the things that they they have done. You know, a, another story that, that I'm gonna share is there was a famous there was a famous um saint on Mount Athos, which is a very old uh, island in Greece where a lot of these monks are. Yes. And one day that saint was listening to this priest talk and the priest said that the priest said that those that die will go to hell. And he said, God will, you know, those that are sinners will die and they'll go to hell and they'll be punished and, and God will punish them because they're evil. And this saint, he looked at the, the man speaking. He said, Father, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, if, he said, if you were in hell, if you were in heaven and you looked down and you could see all those people burning, he said, would you weep? And the old man said, no, of course not. He said, they're sinners and they deserve to burn. Hmm. And the saint looked at him and he said, Father, then I tell you, you don't understand the heart of God. 100%. Absolutely. And that... That is, that, like, when I think about orthodoxy, yeah. it's, and, 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 you know, I say, and I, and I say, you know, God bless our Roman Catholic and our Protestant brothers as well, but there is something about orthodoxy that uh, it, it, I almost can't fathom it because it's like, just, it's just not of this world mm. is the best way to describe it. It's just not of this world. Yeah. Um, and I, and that, that to me was, um, I, I said that I, I'm just so thankful for yes. that God brought me out of that. Hallelujah. And I'm so, and I'm so thankful that, you know, when I got on here, I haven't, I haven't watched one of your videos in a while. I'm not going to lie. When I got on here and I saw you, I was like, Oh man, especially when you're talking about this, I was, there's kind of an excitement. I'm like, yes, you know, you're, you're talking about stuff that, you know, stuff that needs to be talked about, yeah. you know? So, uh, so I just want to say, yeah, God, God, God bless, bless you. you I'm brother. glad the Lord Jesus saved you out of Satanism and you now see the fullness of the love of God. And just to share some why I'm blessed by what you said, <clears throat> when you said that the interpretation of John 11:35, it was Jesus was weeping for mankind, not Lazarus. That blesses my heart because I came to the same conclusion reading scripture and I've actually taught that, that he wasn't crying for Lazarus whom he was about to raise. So when I know that other men of God before me who I can't hold the candlestick to saw the same thing that gives me hope. The spirit is guiding me in the same path that he guided these great men and women of the faith who are now glorified in Christ. So keep on your journey. Keep growing in Jesus. Keep falling in love with Jesus, my brother. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. And keep us in God, prayer, me I, and my daughters, man. And Kiri Yeah, Of course. Of course. Yes, Kiri Yes, yes, Kiri yes. God, 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 God bless you, brother. God bless you. Uh, I know you, you talked. I knew you're kind of searching. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're going to Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism, wherever it is that God guides you. He will, like <laughs> he guided you. So just let's trust in yes. the Lord. And remember, 
Kerelation, Kerelation, Kerelation. Yes, yes. God bless, God bless you. God bless, God bless you. Take care, brother. So good to see you, brother. Good to see you. More You're always in my prayers. Hallelujah. More bless. Thank okay. you. You as well. Thank you. I'm going to share a true story with you guys. <clears throat> guys, don't call me yet. Kevin, hold on. Are you calling me? I want to block you. Bob, hold on. I'll get to you. Just be patient. Don't call. I'll get to you guys. Let me tell you. Now, <clears throat> let me just be clear. <clears throat> if Calvinism is biblical, then we're stuck with it. We can't complain. That's who God is. But I'm now convinced that much of what I learned as Calvinist is not scriptural. And that now the spirit is showing me the fullness of the truth and may he show all of us the fullness of the truth. So <clears throat> now that I'm not convinced in much of the doctrines of Calvinism, <clears throat> let me tell you two true stories. <clears throat> two true stories. Are you ready? One with my ex-wife and one with someone. In fact, Al D, are you here? Al D, I think he's listening. Al D, is he here? My brother in the Lord, I think he was listening in the comment section. Because I'm going to share true, true stories. I don't know if he's here. Well, anyway, he's not here. Uh, so anyway, Aldi knows this person very well. Very well. I'm not going to mention who he is, but Aldi knows this person. <clears throat> there was a young man who would come to my Bible study faithfully. I would teach Bible studies on Thursday nights and Sunday nights. And he was there faithfully. And he would go to three churches every Sunday, just on fire for the Lord. And he did this for two years. One day he came to my class and he left and never returned. This was the Calvinist phase when I started teaching Calvinist, Calvinism. <clears throat> so I saw him sitting outside and I waved at him and he just told me, Shh, move on. I had no idea. He fell back into his former lifestyle, gangbanging. He was a gangbanger, went to jail, got saved, went back. When I confronted him, when I confronted him, folks, I said, dude... Bob, you know I'm going to block you now, right? I'm going to block you now, right? Bob, I'm going to block you. See, it's that filthy, stupid demon. See? Anyway, when I confronted him, stalkers, dude, stalkers. I'm in their head, run free. When I confronted him, you know what he said to me? You know what he said to me? I go, what are you doing, man? Why have you returned back to this lifestyle after all these years? He goes, you know what he said? Well, hey. Don't you teach God's sovereignty and everything's predestined? Well, it just so happened it was predestined for me. And he left me bitter and angry because I didn't know how to refute him. You know that? Because I didn't know how to refute him. I didn't. That's what he told me. And he said it with bitterness. Well, don't you, didn't, don't you teach God's sovereignty? Well, it was predestined for me, right? That's what he said. And I was angry. I go, shame on you, you stupid punk, to use God's sovereignty in that manner. <clears throat> now, th thank God, since then, he's come to the faith, slowly but surely. Someone else used that against me. Yep, Suraya was Sergon. He was an Assyrian, Suraya. But thank God he's come back. He's come back, but I don't think he believes in Calvinism. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, he's come back, guys. It's okay. But I'm just telling you. You know who else used that against me? You know who else used that against me? Anyone? Can guess? My ex-wife. My ex-wife, when she was trying to justify her adultery and turning away, she goes, well, yeah, hey, God predestined, right? I have no choice. God wants me to save. He'll save me. God loves me. He loves me. But if he's predestined me, I have no choice. She used that against me, too. My ex-wife. Yep. And one day she told me this. One day she told me this. She goes, I know I'm going to go to hell. She told me this with her own words. I know I'm going to go to hell. But then she said something that that moment broke my heart. And it was in Target. She was having the adulterous affair with that Puerto Rican guy, Ricky. She goes, I know I'm going to go to hell and I deserve hell. But one thing I'll do, I'll teach my daughters to love Jesus and grow up in the faith and know Jesus Christ. Even though I know I'm going to hell. Now, I know why she said that. She didn't want her daughters to be like her 
and do what she did and end up like her. Yep. Heartbreaking, isn't it? And you know why it's heartbreaking? I'm going to end it with this. I'm going to end it with this. We had a great session. Thank you for making this channel go viral. We have over 440 people. Hit the like button. Pray more people come. And God, keep me holy and pure and righteous and bold as a lion. When I'm done with James White, hopefully I won't have to address Christian brothers by name. At least not this harshly. Just focus on the doctrines, not on individuals. But James White asked for it. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on him. That's why his own family, his house is in shambles too. His house is in shambles too. Anyway, where I need victory, can I tell you a secret? I'll tell you a secret. If I was able to overcome my flesh and my wounds and love my ex-wife as Jesus, I, I believe she would have been changed and she would have fallen in love with Jesus. And she's a reminder to me. I could not love her as Jesus does. And that's why I lost her. That's why I lost her. No, no, it's, it's the truth. And what I mean by that, and it's going to sound like I'm justifying it. I'm not. I'm not justifying it. I'm about to tell you, I'm not just one. I've never had a woman abuse me verbally the way this woman did and physically used to beat me. They say I beat her. She used to physically beat me. And uh, this Assyrian guy is a witness. Assyrian guy, you here, right? The Assyrian guy is here. The Assyrian guy is here. Am I lying, brother? You're a witness, right? Am I lying? Yeah, she used to physically hit me. He's here. He's a witness to all of it. My brother. Where did I fail? I used to tell her, stop with the abuse. Stop with your language. Stop with your tongue. You don't know me. I used to tell her this. I'll get to a point where I'm going to be hardened. I'm going to die to you. I'm going to lose my testimony. I'm going to cuss you out. I'm going to grieve Jesus Christ. I don't want to sin against Jesus. Don't push me because I know myself. I'm going to snap. I'm going to then cuss you out, disrespect you, and I'm going to get Jesus angry. She didn't care. And on many occasions... Oh, yeah, D. Howie, Google it. Husband beating is common. Many men get beat up by their wives, but men are ashamed to admit it. Yep. Oh, yeah, Steve Shaleda. Thank you, brother. Steve, can you confirm, Stephen Shaleda? You, can you confirm if I'm lying, brother? Stephen Shaleda is there. My other brother, brother, I have told you about Stephen Shaleda. I've told you to pray for that man. He's another brother whose family, his mother, have been there for me. Flood him, his wife, his two children, his gorgeous children, his parents, his siblings in prayer. John Cheese, my cousin, and this Assyrian guy. Flood them in prayers. He's there. He's a witness. The hell she put me through. But here's my where I failed. Here's where I failed. I want you to listen to this. Where I failed. I told her, you're going to get me to the point. I'm going to lose my testimony. I'm going to cuss you out. I'm going to insult you. And I want to get Jesus angry. I don't want Jesus to get angry. Please don't go there. She didn't care. And on many occasions, I lost my testimony. And I would cuss her out. You dirty whore. You this and that. I lost my testimony. I couldn't control it. I couldn't do it anymore. And the more I did it, the more she played the victim. And the more she vilified me. And I would tell her, Proverbs 15 verse 1. A gentle answer Turns away wrath. You know what she'd say? Well, you're the mature Christian. Why don't you try that on me? And I realized I'm not going to win. There was no winning. So I lost my testimony repeatedly. Here, here. Here's what Steve Shaleda said. Look, bro, here it goes. Stephen Shaleda, here's his words. Bro, this chick was nuts. So I still love her because she's the mom of your kids. But man, she was nuts. Here it is. Multiple witnesses, even though she's trying to make me look like the villain. So every time I lost my testimony, I cussed her out and I called her a whore and all that. I grieved the Holy Spirit and I got Jesus angrier and angrier. And he let me go through the hell I went through. So where did I fail? I failed to turn the other cheek. I failed to lay my life down before her and be Jesus to her. The way Jesus loved Judas to the end. And laid his life for Judas and never repaid Judas <clears throat> evil for evil. 
I know in my heart, and God was showing me something. You know what he was showing me? And I'm not getting stoic here. I'm being honest. I, I've done a lot of introspection. What was I supposed to learn? And you know what I was supposed to learn? Can I tell you what I was supposed to learn? This is what Jesus wanted to teach me. I want you to hear this from my heart. I want you to hear this from my heart. Jesus was teaching me, when you can love the unlovable, then you have the love of God in your heart. Anyone can love someone that's lovable. Anyone can love someone that makes them happy. You know when you have the love of God? When you can utterly love someone that is so unlovable, so unlovable, it is human, humanly impossible to love that person. And when you can still love them, then you know you are filled with the love of God. So you know what I learned? I learned I do not truly have the love of Christ in me. Because the one person that was crying out for the love of Jesus was her. Had I been able to love her in spite of the abuse, I know God would have done a miracle and made her whole. And even now when I talk to her, you know what I see, guys? Now, I may be wrong. I may be wrong. When I talk, and even now I can't be Christ to her. I lose my testimony with her. And I told her, stop calling me because you see I'm not healed. When I hear your voice, I lose my testimony. I even said, when I hear you, it's like I'm hearing Satan. See, failing the Lord again. And then my, she tells my daughters, and my daughters then say, Baba, that's not right. So then I have to apologize to her because she's even now telling my daughters how I treat her because I can't get along with her. So now I have to shut up and I say, I'm sorry, Bobby. I won't do that anymore. She's using the, my daughters against me. You know what I, you know what I see when she looks at me? You know what I see? Honestly, I may be overanalyzing this. You know what I see when I when I look at her? I see her eyes and I see nothing but heartbreak, misery, not happy, even though she's engaged. And you know what I see in her eyes? Honestly, now I may be wrong, guys. I may be wrong. When I look at her and she looks at me, you know what I see? A woman who, I know it's going to be weird when I say this, who's still in love with me, and she's looking to me saying, why did you fail me? Why did you let it get to this point and fail me? All I wanted was for you to love me. That's what I see in her eyes. I swear that's what I see. I may be deceiving myself because I don't see hatred in her eyes towards me. You know, like a puppy. Have you seen a puppy? A puppy? When a puppy's sad and hurt and they give you those puppy eyes, that's exactly what I see in her eyes. It's too bad. It's too bad. I don't know where her journey will take her, but I pray she breaks before the feet of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The one thing she's never been able to say, never, because she struggles with demonization, narcissism. The one thing, no, it's done for me, Michelle. I just want to be a brother to her and I want to be, you know, a friend to raise up my daughters. The one thing, the one thing I've never heard from her mouth, <clears throat> never heard from her mouth, I'm sorry. I regret what I did. I'm ashamed of what I did. I'm sorry I committed adultery and cheated on you. Forgive me. That's never come out of her mouth. Never come out of her mouth. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Proverbs 28, 13. Let me now give you some biblical counsel. Proverbs 28, 13. Watch here. Proverbs 28, 13. It's first last year. Okay. Here's the secret to reconciliation, healing, and forgiveness. I don't know, David Wutan. Her fruits show she was never saved. But guys, read this now. Now focus. The key to success. 
He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. And that's what she does all her life. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Proverbs 28, 13. One more time. <clears throat> one more time. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. I'm not going back, Samuel. I moved on. I just want to be a brother to her if she repents. We can be brother and sister in Christ. That's it. But Proverbs 28, 13. Guys, Write this verse, etch it in your heart, your mind, write in your palms, put it on your wall, on your refrigerator wall. Here it is. He who conceals his transgressions will not pro prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Confess your sin, turn away and abandon your sin, forsake them, and God will give you compassion. Proverbs 28, 13. Finally, Luke 17 Verse 3, 4. Ms. V, like, don't worry about it. I'm not. Nasha, take it easy. <laughs> Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Okay. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he repents, and if he sins against you seven times a day, and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. You see, conditional. Jesus said, only if your brother repents and asks for forgiveness, forgive. My ex has never asked for forgiveness. What's there to forgive? She's never said, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I sinned against God. I committed adultery. I destroyed this marriage. I dishonored you and my children. Right? So does Jesus say forgive her? No. Did Jesus say forgive her? No. When do I forgive her? When she confesses her sin, forsakes them, and asks for forgiveness. Then she'll be given compassion, right? But how do you forgive her when she's still the victim? How do you forgive her? When she's now engaged to a man named Martin, who's not a believer, who doesn't even care about God, who's got tattoos on his arms, divorced, raising a son, barely speaks English, and his wife hates him and my ex-wife and doesn't want her son to have anything to do with my ex-wife. How do you forgive? She's moved on to another victim. So what's the point of mentioning this? Wasn't to slander her. If you think that way, shame on you. What I'm showing you is, where I failed. Here's where I failed. Let me repeat so we can end it. Here's where I failed. I just could not be Jesus to her. And I could not love her. And to this day, that haunts me. You know why that haunts me? No, she'll cheat on him, Angie. That's her pattern. When she's sick of a guy, she cheats on him. Find someone else. But pray my daughters will be spared from that. My daughters. Here's where I failed. You know what Jesus showed me? Sam, I put a diamond in your hand that needed polishing because it was rough. I put her there so you can be the conduit of my love flowing through you to her so my love would flutter and heal her, but you couldn't do it. You failed. Yes, I did. I did fail. I failed miserably. I could not be Jesus to her. That's why I suffered. I really believe had I been Jesus to her, I wouldn't have to escape the state because of a feminazi and corrupt lawyers and be barred from my children. This is God's discipline on me for my failure in the marriage. But you know what's good news? Can I tell you what's good news? It says, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So this is a sign my Lord Jesus loves me. This is a sign my Father in heaven has not abandoned me. Because God will discipline severely his children whom he loves, who are wayward and failing to honor him. He smacks them. Son, enough. Enough. 
Let me give you the verses. We're not going to look at them. Write down these verses. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. Write these down. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 11. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 11. Write these down, and we'll end it with this. Revelation 3, 19. Revelation 3, 19. We'll end it with this. Jackie, and you're the one to talk? You haven't been spanked? <laughs> okay, now, Revelation 3, 19. We'll end it now. Those whom I love, Jesus speaking, those whom I love, <clears throat> I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. That means if you are being disciplined, you're being rebuked, that's Jesus' sign that he loves you and he's telling you, son, no, you're not going to do that because I know that's going to destroy you. I know what's best for you. No, my precious daughter, no. Now get right and resume the path. So I say thank you. Holy Father, thank you, Son of God, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for disciplining us, disciplining me as a sign that you love us, you love me. Thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Lord willing, see you tomorrow if the Lord wills. I hope you're blessed. Good crowd today. Pray the numbers increase of quality people. Hit the like button. Re-listen to this and pass it on to others. Christ is risen, risen indeed.